Okay, what we're going to do today is kind of talk a little bit about more about something that we've mentioned in previous notes, which is what an infinite limit is. And just kind of a little reminder that infinity, it's not a number. Um, it's more of an abstract idea that we're going to be talking about. I usually call it a destination, but I guess you really would say it's just a long, never-ending journey because you never actually get to the location of infinity. You just keep heading in that direction uh, pretty much forever, which is why it's never-ending. And it is one of those little challenging concepts to work with that was very difficult back in historical periods uh, trying to deal with this idea of infinity. And now we've seen the infinity with our limits when we were looking at the direct substitution that gave us a non-zero real number over zero, which basically meant that we had a vertical asymptote. So we just want to continue and kind of work a little bit more with these uh, just to kind of give ourselves an idea of what's going on, a couple of properties that would apply when you have an infinite limit as opposed to having limits where they both exist. The properties that we had prior to this were all properties where both the limits existed and then you could say the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. That's all only happening because both limits existed. So now we're going to be looking at cases where one limit might exist and the other one doesn't exist because it goes to infinity or negative infinity. Um, just recall your definition of a vertical asymptote that if any of these cases are true, it doesn't have to be all of them, but if from the left or from the right you go to positive or negative infinity, then there will be a vertical asymptote at x equal to c or an infinite discontinuity. And so basically, this is more of a recap of what we had done before, that if it's a basic function, then you have this idea of you can very quickly determine what the limit is. Now, in this one, like all these are the same function. If I try to plug negative 3 in, I try that direct substitution here in the beginning, you're going to get negative 2 over 0. And again, there's that idea of a non-zero real number over 0, which tells me that I have a vertical asymptote. So I know I can actually answer the question down here at the bottom without doing any work. I know that this is going to be does not exist. And I would be done. However, there are times where we want to know what's happening on the left and the right side of the asymptote. So what we're going to do here is I want to look at this kind of in this idea that if I'm approaching negative 3 from the left, I'm going to say, what does that exactly mean? So if x approaches negative 3 from the left, you have to remember that what you're doing is you're approaching negative 3 from below, which would mean that the x values that you're picking as you get closer and closer and closer to negative 3, since they're below, they're going to be less than negative 3. So this is kind of what this means here, that we are approaching from below negative 3, so x is less than negative 3. Now the reason that I want to look at this is what this implies, I'll just put an or right here because it means the same thing, if x is less than negative 3 because we're approaching from below, then x plus 3 is less than 0. What I'm building up to here, and what I really want this fact for, is that I want to be able to think of this as a sign chart. You're not going to have a calculator necessarily in all cases. And what I want to do is I want to determine whether this is going to positive or negative infinity. Now we know that as we approach negative 3 from the left, negative 2 is a constant. So it's pretty much always going to be negative 2, so it's not going to change. You can think of your sign chart as we're looking at our negative 3 that we're approaching. And we only care about values that are really, really close to negative 3. So I don't really care what's happening way over here or way over there on this function. I'm only trying to determine what's happening right to the left of 3. So this is my as x approaches negative 3 from the left. So I'm over here on this side coming up. And I want to basically figure out whether it's going to be positive or negative. Because if this rational function ends up being positive, then it grows without bound and goes to infinity. And if it ends up being negative, it would decrease without bound and go down to negative infinity. So I just need to figure that out. Now the top is constant. Negative 2, and that's always negative. So I can kind of add that in as a negative on my sign chart. Now the bottom is x plus 3. Now come back here to the work that I just did right here. Since I'm approaching from the left, 
which means below, the x values that I will be looking at will all be below negative 3. Which, just doing a little bit of algebra, just moving the 3 over, it tells me that x plus 3 is always less than 0. This is what I'm getting at. That means x plus 3 is a negative number. And if I were to have a negative divided by a negative, that's a positive. So equals positive. So as soon as I get this information, I know that on the left side of this asymptote, because you got a positive number, you would be going to infinity, and so I can simply go equal infinity. And you don't have to have a calculator, you're not just looking at the screen and determining where you're going, you're thinking of this in terms of your sign chart to determine what's going on. All right, we're going to do the same thing down here for the second part, except now we're going to be approaching from the right. I'll change color just so we have a different color we're dealing with. So I'm coming from this way. This is as x approaches negative 3 from the right, which means from above. So if x approaches negative 3 from the right, then x is above negative 3, which means it's more than negative 3, which really is the same as saying x plus 3 is greater than 0. That it's a positive number. And again, this is going to be the key that's going to help me determine this limit without a calculator. Again, the constant on the top is still negative. The bottom, x plus 3, on the right side is going to be positive. A negative divided by a positive is negative overall. So on this side, the graph must be going decreasing without bound and heading down toward negative infinity, so this would equal negative infinity. And so that gives us kind of a quick way to determine whether the infinite limit, as I approach the vertical asymptote, whether I'm going up to infinity or down to negative infinity. Kind of turn it into the sign chart idea that you're looking at. You do not have to show this work. I'm writing it down for you so that you can basically figure out whether you have a positive or a negative. You're really just going to do this in your head. You're just going to go, okay, I'm approaching negative 3 from above. So that means x is greater than 3, which means x plus 3 is greater than, okay, positive. And then you put it in your sign chart. So the idea is that you're using this information to determine whether you have a constant divided by a positive or a negative number so that you can choose whether you have going to infinity or negative infinity. All right, now the second case and, you know, and the reason why we picked this is it's fairly straightforward. It's nothing but a simple transformation of 1 over x, your parent graph. It has a shift to the left of 3 and a vertical flip and then a stretch of 2. So you could, you know, in your mind, instead of doing this, you can just do a quick sketch and think about, well, what would this graph look like? It went to the left 3, so the vertical asymptote 1, 2, 3 would be here at negative 3. And 1 over x has a horizontal asymptote at 0. I didn't shift up or down, so that stays in the same place. So we know that goes in there. Uh, and then we pretty much go, okay, the negative is going to flip it. And that's going to be the key to you that it used to. Remember your 1 over x. 1 over x looks like this. So if I flip it vertically, it's going to look like this. So you could also think of this in terms of transformations. And then you can see that on the right side, you're going to, I'm sorry, on the left side, you're going to infinity. And on the right side, you're going down here to negative infinity. So that can kind of give you a visual representation of it as well. All right, let's take a look at our secant graph and kind of let's say, well, how are we going to deal with this one? All right, so now in this one, we're going to kind of do the same idea. I'm only to the left side here, because I think once you get the idea of what's going on, I can't direct substitute in 5 pi over 2, because secant of 5 pi over 2 is undefined. Now, why is it undefined? Because secant is 1 over cosine. Okay, Cosine of 5 pi over 2 is 0, I get 1 over 0. There's my number over 0, which tells me I have a vertical asymptote. So I only want to know what's happening on the left side of this. But just like we did up here, what we're just basically trying to figure out is whether we have positive or a negative. And if you think of secant as 1 over cosine, so if I think of this as 1 over cosine of x, and I think about x is approaching, okay, so if x is approaching 5 pi over 2 from the left, 
then let's think about what that means. That means that x, I'm approaching from the left, is a little bit smaller than 5 pi over 2. Now, in terms of your trig functions, what I really just need to figure out is what quadrant I'm in if I am just right before 5 pi over 2. Because if I know what quadrant, I'm not going to do x minus 5 pi over 2. That's going to be kind of um, not as algebraically intuitive as what you want. In the trig functions, what you want to do is think about unit circle. If we start 0 and then pi, and then we would come back around over here, we would be back at 2 pi. If we think about in between 0 and pi, you would have your pi over 2. Down here would be 3 pi over 2. And then if you think about what you're doing coming around, where would 5 pi over 2 be? 5 pi over 2 is coterminal to pi over 2. Now, once I know that, if, I, if x is a little bit below 5 pi over 2, so I haven't quite made it around to 5 pi over 2. So I'm coming around, I'm heading toward 5 pi over 2 from below, from smaller values, and heading toward it. What quadrant are we in? We're in quadrant 1. What do we know about cosine in quadrant 1? It's positive, and secant is positive. So once I basically get here, in my mind I'm saying, hey, I'm in quadrant 1, which means cosine of x and secant of x are positive. So you basically are going to have in this idea of your sign chart. Now obviously in your sign chart there are other critical numbers other than 5 pi over 2 that's giving me the vertical asymptote. But I don't care about those. I only care about what happens right before 5 pi over 2. And since I'm in quadrant 1, I'm going to have 1 divided by a positive number, which is a positive number. And therefore, this is going to infinity. Okay, so that gives you another example of what you're looking at in terms of, without a calculator, trying to figure out where the graph is going, what the infinite limit is. Okay, so this is just a kind of a recap of what we just talked about. If you have a constant divided by an increasingly small number, what you basically are trying to determine is whether that increasingly small number, because you're getting really, really close to zero, which is going to cause your vertical asymptote, whether that increasingly small number is positive or negative. And you look at whether your constant is positive or negative. And the combination of those will tell you whether you're going to positive infinity or negative infinity. If you have positive constant over an increasingly small positive number, then you would go to positive infinity. If you have a negative constant over an increasingly small negative number, then it would go to negative infinity. And likewise, common sense here, if you had positive constant a negative increasingly small number or positive constant, oops, sorry, get my last case in there, negative constant over a positive increasingly small number. So this kind of is the idea that you're looking at. You're trying to figure out whether or not your denominator, which is going to zero, whether you are approaching it from a positive or a negative number and you can figure out what your limit is. All right, so let's have you, I'm going to let you do this example too. And then we'll come back together and I'll show you the answer to that. So pause the video, try example two. Now it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, maybe I'll just, just try A and see what you think about that. And then come back together and we'll discuss how to do part A. And then I'll let you finish up with B and C. All right, so coming back, we'll see what you came up with on this. Um, and you can say, yay, I got it right, or, or no, I didn't. But before I give you the answer, let's talk about how I'm going to approach this one. I'm approaching 4 from the right, I believe, on this. Let me check my actual. When I import these PDFs, they don't, it's hard to read sometimes. All right, so that's positive. So I'm approaching from the right. So if x approaches 4 from the right, that means I'm above. So then x is above 4. But now, look at what you have right here. This is a little bit more tricky because I need to figure out how th what this is in relationship to this. You're no doing nothing more than manipulating your inequality that you know based on which side you're approaching on. 
if x is greater than 4, notice I have a minus x in here. I'll multiply both sides by a negative. When you multiply by a negative, then you have to flip the signs. So it becomes less than negative 4. I'm going to add the 4 over, so it becomes 4 minus x is less than 0. Now be careful with powers. I'm cubing it, and I have a negative number. So this is a negative number, and I cube it. I ask myself the question, is a negative number cubed going to still be negative? And the answer is yes. So I come all the way down to here. So now I have determined that this denominator is going to be an increasingly small negative number when I'm looking at this in my sign chart. So here at 4, and where I have my little vertical asymptote coming in, if I come in from the left, I know that in the bottom of the fraction I'm going to have an increasingly small negative number. And in the top I have a positive constant 3. A positive divided by a negative is negative. So this would approach negative infinity. Now, be careful if you're doing this uh, procedure down here. If this had been a square, a negative number squared is going to be positive, and you would have to flip the sign. So you kind of have to be a little careful with your powers. You don't just take the square both sides and don't do anything to the inequality. You have to think about what happens when you raise the power on both sides. All right, so let's let you go. You can probably guess what you think this is going to be. It's going to, and this one, of course, is does not exist. So go ahead, but do this version of it and think about it and come up with your answer for B. Alright, so let's come back together, take a look at the work I've done here. If X approaches 4 from the left, you're coming from below, so X is less than 4. I multiplied both sides by a negative, switch my sign, added the 4 over to this side, cubed it, so I now have figured out that the 4 minus X cubed, this denominator, is an increasingly small positive number. So I have a positive number on the bottom, positive number because of the 3 on the top, and that is going to give me overall a positive number. So this would equal infinity. Alright, now what happens if the number is not a constant? So what, in this case, we're going to kind of look at this kind of two different ways. In this problem, the denominator, and I'm just going to go very quickly through kind of the denominator part. If I'm approaching 3 from the right, okay, x approaches 3 from the right, that implies that x is greater than 3 or x minus 3 is greater than 0. Okay, So when we take a look at that and we have this x minus 3 is greater than 0, we know that in the bottom we are going to have, thinking about our sign chart here at 3, and we're approaching from the right, so we're coming from this side. In the bottom, we're going to have a positive number. Now we look at the top. As x approaches 3 from the right, well, this limit you already know. I mean, if I can just plug in 3 here, it's, this is not what's going to bother me. The limit and as, as x approaches 3 from the left or right of 2x is 6, which is a positive number. So this is going to end up being 6 over a positive number, which overall is positive. So this will equal infinity. It actually doesn't bother me that I don't have a constant here as long as the limit as x approaches it, as it approaches this value c, as long as this limit exists and it's a number, it kind of follows the same rules. From the left, okay, now I'm not even going to do the work down here. If I'm approaching from the left, then x minus 3 is going to be a negative number. So I'm going to have a negative on the bottom. And again, the top is going to be 6, so 6 divided by negative is overall negative. This is going to negative infinity. And you should go back and verify these if you want to pick up your calculator and graph your function for both of these in example 2 and verify that we have the same um, behavior that you're expecting to see there. Alright, so in general, this is our uh, one property of infinite limits that you kind of just need to pay attention to. If the limit of uh, C and L, real numbers, the limit as X approaches C of F is going to be 0, which means that it's going to be an increasingly small number. It's going to get closer and closer and closer to 0. The limit as X approaches C of G of X is going to be a constant. It's going to be L. So when I calculate this limit, 
I can still, even though I have a zero in the denominator, I can still think of this as, I'll kind of write it right down here, the limit as x approaches c of g of x divided by the limit as x approaches c of f of x. And the reason that this is still kind of okay is because I get a constant in the top, and this is going to zero, but that doesn't bother me because basically then I know, hey, this is going to have a vertical asymptote. And I can just look at the sign of the constant, of what the limit is approaching, and look at the sign of f of x when it is really close to c, whether I'm on the left or the right, and then use that to determine the limits. Alright, now let's look at a, kind of some different properties. And in this one, notice that instead of the limit for f going to zero, an increasingly small number, now I want to look at properties for when you have a limit going, approach, is x approaches c of an increasingly big number. So what happens when you have an infinite limit? So here, suppose I'm looking at the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus g of x. Then I'm looking at the sum or difference of two functions based on the fact that one of them exists. Notice I'm, I'm qualifying. One of them has to exist and one of them is an infinite limit. What do we think is going to happen here? And basically, all you have to do is think about this in terms of if I had a constant plus a really, really big number, it's still going to be a really, really big number. It doesn't matter whether the constant is positive or negative. A number plus something huge is always going to end up being huge. So this, you can think of this in terms of the limit as x approaches c of f of x, it still kind of follows the rule. That because the limit here is an infinity, and infinity plus or minus a number doesn't affect it, this is going to be infinity. I will caution you, however, if it's a number plus or minus infinity, that it would go to negative infinity. So be careful if the infinite limit is over here on this side. Um, but the idea is you should just be able to look at it and tell what that limit is going to do. Now with the product, what we're looking at is the limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x. And again, a lot of this is common sense. If I have a really big number times a positive constant, then you're going to end up with a positive number. So you can still think of this as the limit of the product is the product of the limits. Limit as x approaches c of f of x times the limit as x approaches c of g of x. And a positive times a positive is positive. And then likewise, if I want to do the limit as x approaches c of f times g. Same rule. It's almost like I don't know why I rewrite this twice. But if you have a positive times a negative, then you end up at negative infinity. So it's really all just common sense about positives and negatives. Uh, then down here at the bottom, let's talk about our quotient. So I want to do the limit as x approaches c. Now, we already discussed what happens when you have um, the function going to 0 on the bottom. What I'm going to do here is I want to put the g of x on the top and I want to put the f of x on the bottom. So now what we're looking at is we have a number in the top, a constant in the top, and then we have a really, really big number in the bottom. What happens when you take a small number divided by a really, really big number? This actually is going to be a special case where it equals 0. Think about 1 over 100 versus 1 over a thousand, versus 1 over a million, that you're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So as x gets really, really large, and this is fixed, this fraction is going to get really, really small. Now notice, this is a different case. The one that I was working on up here, that's prior to this example, let's go back to the next page, that this one, what we're looking at is it's not an increasingly big number on the bottom, it's an increasingly small number. So fixed divided by tiny, goes to plus or minus infinity, while a fixed divided by a really, really big number is always going to go to zero. It doesn't really matter whether it's you're on the left or the right side. 
So this kind of gives you some properties that you're going to look at. Okay, for example, let's take a look at example three. So in this, I have the limit as x approaches two, and I can kind of split this as this is my one function, here's my other function. Now, since I'm approaching two here, we pretty much know that this limit does not exist. This limit does. This is going to be a does not exist. However, what if I wanted to do the limit as x approaches 2 of 4 minus x minus x over x minus 2, and let's go from the right. All right. Um, and now before I answer this question, since I'm doing a minus here, just make sure you realize that the properties I listed above, that they hold for one-sided limits, and limits where they have negative infinity instead of infinity. And you just have to use common sense, basically, to figure it out. So let's take a look at this. Since I look at this, this first one, the limit exists. And that's the rule. The limit of this one exists. So we're good to go there. This limit is going to be an infinite limit. And I know that because when I plug in the 2 for my direct substitution, I get 2 over 0. So I know that that's going to cause a vertical asymptote. Doesn't matter what this is doing over here. This causes a vertical asymptote. So now what I'm going to do when I look at this is I need to figure out, is this going to positive or negative infinity? I'm approaching 2 from the right, which means I'm x is above 2, which means that x minus 2 is bigger than 0. So that's a positive number. The top, the x, and since I'm going to 2, the limit as x approaches 2 of x is 2. So I end up with 2 over a positive number. So this would be positive, but be careful, you're subtracting. This is kind of the idea that you're looking at the limit as x approaches 2 from the right, 4 minus x, minus the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of x over x minus 2. So this is going to be going to infinity, but we're going to be subtracting it. This is going to be going to the number 2, and it doesn't matter what this number is. A constant minus infinity is going to be negative infinity. And then we're done with this problem. All right, let's take a look at this one right here. Here we're taking the limit as x approaches 1 from the left, and I've got this fraction situation going on. So let's see. Let's try direct substitution and see what happens. If I plug in a 1 here, I'm going to get a 2. If I plug in a 1 here, I get cotangent of pi. And remember that cotangent is uh, cosine of pi over sine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Sine of pi is 0. So negative 1 over 0 is undefined. So that's going to give me a undefined value in the bottom if we have a problem. You can't have a cotangent of pi x here. But I can investigate the limit. All right, using the property that we have up here, which is this quotient property, that as long as this limit is going to infinity and this limit's constant, then we're going to be able to determine that this is going to be a, a zero because it's a fixed number over a really, really big number. So when I look at this, I start thinking, well, what's happening on cotangent at 1? Well, it's going to be an asymptote. It's going to be a vertical asymptote because of this. So I can think of this and, and like splitting it up as x approaches 1 from the left of x squared plus 1 over the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of cos tangent of pi x. The top is a constant. It approaches 2. The bottom of approaching from the left, and it actually doesn't even really matter whether I'm going to positive or negative infinity, but let's think about it. If I approach 1 from the left, x approaches 1 from the left, that means that x is below 1. And when I plug it in, think about this pi x, that means that pi x is below pi, right below pi. And if I am right below pi, coming around, I am in quadrant 2. And in quadrant 2, cotangent is negative. So this would actually be negative infinity, although it didn't even really matter. Once you know that you had a vertical asymptote in that location, the plus or minus in the bottom does not matter because 2 divided by 
negative infinity, 2 divided by infinity, it's always going to be 0. So anytime there's an infinite limit in the bottom, you actually don't even need to do the work to figure it out. All I basically need to go is look at this and go, hey, infinite limit, this constant, L divided by an infinite limit, is always going to end up being 0, and we're done with that. Now be very careful. Notice that I am kind of skipping over some things here. But what we're doing is looking at limits where at least one exists, either the top or the bottom, when you're looking at it. That in that case, you can figure out what's going on as long as only one of the limits or one of the functions has an infinite limit. Now if they both have an infinite limit, um, infinity over infinity, negative infinity over infinity, or so on, this is still indeterminate. We need more, more tools in order to figure out what that is. And we will do that in another section. So that kind of wraps up what we're looking at in section 2.5 with our infinite limits. And we'll come back to these special cases, uh, the indeterminate forms of infinity over infinities in a, the next section. So thank you so much.